Well, good afternoon. I said good afternoon. There we go. Very good. My name's Ken Elmore. I'm the Dean of Students at Boston University, and this is a wonderful sight to see today. A great gathering of the community, students, faculty, staff, friends from around the greater Boston area. My job here is just to keep us moving along. So without further ado, for opening remarks and welcomes, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the 10th president of Boston University, Dr. Robert A. Brown. President Brown. Don't go away. Welcome to this wonderful occasion and a special welcome to Dr. Muhammad Yunus to Boston University. As we all know, Dr. Yunus was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006. And it's a great occasion to have him visit us, but I'd like to make sure the audience understands that there's a great connection between the Nobel Peace Prize and Boston University. We have three distinguished people connected with this university that have won this award. Martin Luther King, Jr., who studied here and is a distinguished alumnus of the School of Theology. Ellie Wiesel, who's on the faculty in, uh, at Boston University. And just recently, Al Gore, who had the good fortune and wisdom to marry Tippy Gore, who's an alum of Boston University. <laughs> Three connections of the prize. Well, Dr. Yunus is an inspiration to us all. As you will hear, after receiving his doctorate in economics in the United States, he returned to his native Bangladesh to teach economics. Instead of teaching it, he lived it. He became a banker on a revolutionarily small scale. Now, we all live in a scientific age where we hear the words nanoscience and nanotechnology all the time. But there are few inventions that are being considered by these scientists and engineers that will have a larger impact on our lives, and I dare say the same is true for most large bankers, than the dream that Dr. Yunus began. He is still a teacher. He teaches us by example and by deed. He teaches us about hope, opportunity, and fulfillment. We are grateful that you can be with us today, sir and to share with your, your lessons with us. And we are also grateful to the students who have made this lecture possible today, especially Shadeb Mahmoud. Shadeb? The, the president of the Bangladeshi Student Association at Boston University. On behalf of our colleagues, our students, and our friends who are able to be with us today, I am very pleased to welcome you to Boston University. Thank you, President Brown. It's now my pleasure to bring back up this young man, Mr. Shadab Mahmoud. Uh, he is a Boston University student completing his studies, his undergraduate studies, in biomedical engineering. Mr. Mahmoud. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dean Elmore, for that kind introduction. And thank you, President Brown, for inaugurating this momentous event. I will begin by wishing everyone Eid Mubarak. Secondly, secondly, and please let me finish my sentence before doing anything, I will ask everyone to give a huge round of applause to our honorable guest for generously accepting our invitation. All right, let's hear it for Dr. Muhammad Yunus. We are proud, sir. It is a truly joyous occasion for all of us gathered here today, because it is the day that we are honored by the presence of one of the most globally respected men of our time, Dr. Muhammad Yunus. Dr. Yunus has conquered the hearts and minds of the rich and poor alike through his vision of a world where poverty is history. I have had the distinct honor of meeting Dr. Yunus once before back in the year 2001 um, when among a handful of students he awarded me 
the prestigious Daily Star Award for academic excellence. This was the first time I had ever seen or heard of Muhammad Yunus, and I was overwhelmed with pride and respect upon learning of his charitable cause. I've come to know Dr. Yunus to be a man who has led his mind to be successful as both a student and a teacher, and has followed his heart to become an inspiration and a hope for millions of impoverished worldwide. Through his rare gift of achieving harmony between knowledge and conviction, he has been able to conquer one of the biggest obstacles facing every human being, oneself. His revolutionary ideas and his bottom-up approach to promoting self-reliance sound like a very familiar echo that resounds through history from the voice of a man named Mahatma Gandhi. Both Dr. Yunus and the late Gandhi use their intellect to recognize that, the, that a nation's prosperity lies in the economy of the villages. Both of these men use their kindness to make poor villages prosperous by promoting self-reliance at the individual level and lending the individual identity within a community. As students, we must nurture ourselves with leadership, courage, and compassion, and encourage others to do so as well. Dr. Yunus was both a meritorious student and a student leader. Hailing from what is both my and Dr. Yunus's common ancestral village of Hatajari, uh, near the port city of Chittagong in Bangladesh, a young Yunus passed his matriculation exams with flying colors. He was also a model Boy Scout, having represented his country, then East Pakistan, several times at international scout jamborees. Dr. Yunus obtained his bachelor's and master's degrees in economics from Dhaka University, and in 1965, won the Fulbright Scholarship, with which he came to the United States to obtain his PhD in economics from Vanderbilt University. In spite of all his success, he never forgot his own country. In 1971, the Bangladesh Liberation War broke out, sparked by a student-led struggle called the Language Movement, the sole purpose of which was to preserve the freedom of speech and the result of which was the liberation of Bangladesh. Dr. Yunus rallied support in the United States for, the ind for this independence and founded a citizen's committee. He returned to an independent, albeit poverty-stricken Bangladesh and joined as the head of the economics department Chittagong University, which was located near his old village home where he had spent his childhood. It was while teaching at Chittagong that he realized the inapplicability of his economic theories in the alleviation of poverty. And so, he went to his village where he lent 27 US dollars to 42 poor people. What followed was the birth of Grameen Bank which replaced traditional collateral requirements with a banking system based on mutual trust, strict supervision, participation, and accountability. As of July 2007, Grameen Bank has issued 6.8 billion US dollars to 7.4 million borrowers, with more than 97% of the borrowers being poor women. With a loan recovery rate of over 98%, Grameen Bank is perhaps the most successful bank in the world. It is worth noting here that, based in part of success of Grameen Bank's microfinance model, the United Nations re recently declared one of its Millennium Development Goals to cut world poverty in half by the year 2015. This, my friends, is history in the making. Dr. Yunus is a person whose mind was filled with elegant economic theories that were time-tested legacies of great thinkers past. But his heart was filled with remorse for the knowledge he held broke down well, once he stepped outside the classroom walls. Even as a teacher, Dr. Muhammad Yunus is a prime example for students. He never stopped questioning his knowledge and his purpose in life. He was not blinded by the veil of complacency and self-absorption that prevents so many of us from seeing the obvious truth. Because his belief in self-reliance and kindness to fellow human beings shown through all the illusions and obstacles that society teaches us to accept. He is a man who put his utmost trust in the poor in spite of the way society is structured to make poverty seem like a deserved punishment or a natural condition. He gave opportunity to the poor while preserving their dignity as equal human beings. 
each capable of pursuing and fulfilling their own dreams. As a result, Dr. Muhammad Yunus became the voice, the advocate, and the banker to the poor. In order to achieve such clarity of vision and kindness of heart, one must overcome many struggles and keep asking the right questions. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Such is the way of thinking that we, as students, must strive to acquire on the road to creating our own legacies. For when future generations look back upon us, may the hallmark of our generation be the end of poverty. Thank you. Oh, faculty and staff, students and friends, it is with great enthusiasm and overwhelming pride that I introduce to you the 2006 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, the founder of Grameen Bank, the author of Banker to the Poor, and just an extraordinary human being, Dr. Muhammad Yunus. Give it up! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Shadab, for your very eloquent introduction. I was looking around, who is he talking about? <laughs> it's a wonderful day, it's a lovely day outside, and it's a very special day for me too, for all of us, because this is the end of Ramadan, month of fasting. And today is the day of festivity, Eid, the day of happiness and celebration. So Eid Mubarak to all of you. And uh, it's also special for me personally because last year on 13th October, the Nobel Peace Prize was announced. <laughs> so I'm here today exactly one year later on 13th of October. <laughs> Well, that was uh, quite an announcement because uh, that was an explosion of happiness in Bangladesh. Everybody was so excited in Bangladesh that we got the Nobel Peace Prize. So, uh, and we were very happy within Grameen Bank also because not only I was given um, the Nobel Peace Prize, also Grameen Bank was given Nobel Peace Prize. For us, it's important because we succeeded in creating an institution in Bangladesh, which is not very easy country to build an institution that which became capable of deserving Nobel Peace Prize. So that kind of gave us a lot of confidence that we can build an institution in a country where things don't go right. If you are in Bangladesh, no matter when, today or 10 years back or 20 years back, 50 years back. This is one country where it's very easy to get frustrated. Things don't seem to work. And that's the frustration which drives people, drives particularly young people to seek new ways of addressing the issues. And I was teaching in one of the universities in the States, uh, Middle Tennessee State University near Nashville. And Bangladesh ran into, at that time it was known as East Pakistan, a part of Pakistan. Pakistan had two parts, East Pakistan and West Pakistan, divided by India in between about 1,000 miles apart. So we got into a big war between the two parts of the country. And one side was uh, the government and the military attacking the civilians of the other side. And instantaneously, uh, East Pakistan declared its own independence, that we don't want to live with Pakistan anymore, we want to be a separate country. And person, young people around the world coming from East Pakistan, we declared our allegiance 
to a new country, Bangladesh. So we went through the whole one year of nine months of war, a lot of devastations, a lot of killings. At the end of 1971, Bangladesh became an independent country. So as soon as we became an independent country, I resigned from my job. I said, this is the time to go back and be part of the efforts in building the country. So that's when I went back. And I joined Chittagong University, one of the universities in Bangladesh, and start my job in this university as a teacher of economics. And each liberation war, something you get, you get a tremendous amount of emotionally charged that you want to create a new country, you want to build a new future for your nation. And after you achieve that, you go through the euphoria that now is the time to build it in the images of your dreams. But in most cases, those dreams turn into nightmares. They don't work out. Things seem to go wrong rather than go right. And this exactly happened in our case in Bangladesh. Things started going wrong. Economy was sliding down very fast. And the country was in total sham, total devastated uh, condition. So by 1974, we had a terrible famine. People dying of hunger. You are, we are familiar with people dying of diseases. But seeing people dying of hunger, it's a completely different experience. It's not a disease. It's not something that you can reach for medicine, you reach for medical help. It's nothing like that just dying because there's just not tiny little bit to eat. And that made it more uh, kind of painful because you are teaching elegant theories in your economics class. So here you teach those beautiful, absolutely sophisticated theories and telling your students how economics can address all these problems. Then at the end of the class, you walk out of the classroom, you see the stark reality of the country, people dying of hunger. Your economics theory doesn't come into any use for them. So you wonder what good it is in the face of the situation that you confront. So gradually, a feeling of emptiness seizes you. It's a, that you see that uh, all those brilliant theories don't come to use when it comes to situation like what prevails around you. So out of that frustration, one of the things that uh, I thought I could do, instead of trying to be an economist, I could just try to be a simple human being, which I can always revert to, and be with the people, and see as a human being what I can do not as an economist, because this is not going to work for me. And the university that I was teaching is right in the middle of the villages. So it's not an urban center, urban-based university campus, like in most of the cases that you see. So we had a lot of controversy about it, whether we should build the university right in the middle of the villages. But this time, for me, came out very handy. I could just walk out of the classroom walk out of the borderline of the campus and be in the traditional village, centuries old village next door. So I thought that's what I'll do every day. I'll go around and meet people there, see if there's anything that I can do for one single person to make it easy for that person even to live a little better for this one day. I, can, I don't have the capacity to make a permanent contribution in any way, but definitely I have the capacity to help one person for one day. So with that kind of idea that I was going around and finding things to do every day, and I did a lot of little things, and I feel a little bit at ease because watching it happen and the feeling that you are totally useless is a terrible feeling. And now I could at least feel that I, I, I'm 
trying to do something and I'm some, in some cases I'm doing something. And as I was doing and feeling a little better, I gradually get acquainted with something else which I never figured before. How money lenders in that village kind of grab poor people and totally destroy their life for tiny little money. Accidentally I got into that picture and I was shocked by the first instance that I saw. And I was curious, I wanted to know how does it go about and how much desperate people must be to go to the money lender to get into that kind of contractual obligations. So what I did, I took a student of mine from my class and went around in the village for the next few days to make a list of people who borrowed from the money lenders. In a few days I made the list complete and it had 42 names on my list and the total money they borrowed was $27. And I couldn't believe because I never heard in terms, anything about in terms of $27. I'm trained to think in terms of millions of dollars and billions of dollars. <laughs> we, in the classroom, we talk about the <clears throat> national development plans, five-year plans, if you remember those days. We used to be big in five-year plans. So we talk about the five-year plans and how investments have to be made in the country so that gradually economy picks up and poor people improve their life and things go better. But here I see completely different picture. Only a few years from the classroom where I teach. It's not on the other side of the moon, it's right there. <laughs> so I was amazed that these person like us teaching those economic theories or economic uh, discussions that we have in our classrooms I have absolutely no idea what goes on in the village next door. And there's no solution to that in our discussion. So after I overcome my shock, I can see that how terrible that problem is. But suddenly it occurred in my mind, the problem is tough, problem is very difficult. But the solution is so simple. And it excited me by the simpleness of the solution. It just hit me, instead of worrying about, about the whole problem, I can just take $27 out of my own pocket and give, it, give the money to these 42 people to return the money to the money lenders. And they will be free. Money lenders cannot touch them anymore. I was very excited. And I did exactly that. I gave this $27 to all these 42 people, person by person, telling them that here is the money, you return the money and you continue what you're doing. And you can think about paying me back when you are comfortable, when it's easy for you. Don't worry about it. And I thought, this is something I did, I feel good about it, at least I solved one problem in a very concrete way. But something else happened, which I didn't expect. When I go back to the village again, talking to people, now people look at me in a very different way. They look at me in a very strange way, as if I have descended from the heaven. I said, my God, for $27, if you can become an angel, why shouldn't you do more of this? you still can afford to give some more money. And if it's so important for their life, you should do it. So that kind of new question haunted me. How do I do more? I could still give some money from my pocket. And I was thinking, no, that maybe not be the solution because it has to go on in its own way. Again, another brilliant idea came to my mind. Why don't I link, link these people to the bank which is located in the campus. And bank should be very happy because after all, this is a tiny little money for the bank to give it to the people and they become the hero and everybody will appreciate what they are doing. So I thought it's a win-win situation from both sides. 
and I become the matchmaker for them. So with the kind of this brilliant thought in my mind, I go to talk to the manager of the bank and I propose to him that this is your opportunity. You lend the money to the poor people in the village. He almost fell from the sky. <laughs> he couldn't believe that I have such an audacious plan for him. He said, no, it cannot be done. Bank cannot lend money to the poor people. And the more he insists, the more I raise question. Why shouldn't bank give it? What is the problem with the bank? And only explanation he could give, bank cannot give loans to the poor people because they are not creditworthy. I said, how do you know that? Have you ever given loans to the poor people? He said, no, I have not done that. So how do you know? He said, everybody knows that. It's poor people cannot pay back because their stomach is empty. If you give the money, they will just eat and forget about it. I said, is it that simple? Then why should the moneylenders lend money to them? They know it too. Anyway, I couldn't persuade him. He couldn't persuade me. So we were in a big, we locked into a big fight. So that fight went to the higher officials in the banking hierarchy, went to talk to the senior officials in the banking world. Everybody tells me the same thing. It, it went on for months and no solution. Finally, I came up with another idea. This time I learned from their language and I used their language. I said, why don't you accept me as a guarantor? I sign all your papers, I take the risk, and you give the money. All I want to open your door, and that's important for me. So this time, since I speak their language, they couldn't really throw me out of the window. So they had to continue this dialogue, and finally, I think, to get rid of me, they agreed. So at least they thought this will end the whole story, and I'll learn in a hard way that it doesn't work. So they agreed, and I was very happy that uh, finally I won the case and I can go ahead and take the money. And that's exactly what I did. I took the money from the bank and started giving the money to the people in the village. And the bank manager on the first day said, Dr. Yunus, say goodbye to your money. <laughs> this money will never come back. <laughs> and get ready to pay back the money. I said, I have no idea, I have never done this. I thought this is the right thing to do and I'm doing it. I'll find a way and I'm sure people will pay back, but if not, I'll find a way how to do it right. So I came up with tiny little ideas to try so that people find it easy to pay back. And it worked. Every penny came back. So I got very excited that what I never imagined that it will happen that way, although I was hoping that it will work, now this time it's real, it worked. So with that enthusiasm, I kept on expanding this. The more I become successful, the more bank becomes reluctant. Because he was hoping that the first time it will be such a disaster that I will not pursue this anymore. But it was not a disaster. So he was hoping second time it will be a disaster, it was not a disaster. So every time it becomes successful, he feels very disappointed. <laughs> so seeing his reluctance, I thought that may be not the right thing to do. In the beginning, I had no idea whether this is going to work or not. I had a belief. That's the only thing I had. And now it's not a belief. It's a demonstrated facts. I said, if anybody in the world tells me now that poor are not creditworthy, I'll go and scream my head off telling that this is a lie. This is not true. Because I see it every day. People are paying back 100%. How can they not be creditworthy? Where in Bangladesh, rich people borrow from big banks and don't care to pay back. In Bangladesh, banks are filled with big loan defaulters. And here the poor people taking tiny loans and paying back. So I thought maybe I should create a separate bank. Bank which will do exclusively business with the poor people. I needed a license, I needed a permission from the government. So I went to the government. Another struggle began to persuade the government. 
Because government has a crazy idea. How can you have a bank for the poor people? And they started arguing with me, we have enough of problem running banks for the rich people because they don't pay back. Now, why do you want to create more problem by creating another bank for the poor people? And I kept saying, look, this experience will be much different than the experience that you have because uh, here are your records. Anyway, it continued for two years, and I was very lucky. Finally, I got through the kind of labyrinth of government and finally got my proposal approved, and we got ourselves a bank, and we created this bank called Grameen Bank. Grameen means village, so we wanted to call it a village bank. So that became a village bank. So we kept on expanding and expanding. And today, right now, we have seven and a half million borrowers in Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. 97% of them are women. And the bank gives tiny loans to the poor people for income generating activity. And they take the loan and start self-employment and improve their economic situation and move up the poverty situation. 64% of the borrowers of Grameen Bank who have been with Grameen Bank for more than five years have already crossed over the poverty line. So it's not a simple just giving loans. It's a step-by-step -step people are moving out of poverty. Every day, every week, every month, more and more families are moving out. And we have been concentrating on one particular area now, the children of Grameen families. The Grameen families are basically illiterate families, cannot read, cannot write. These are women who never held money in their hand, no experience whatsoever. For the first time, touching money is an exciting feeling for them, for it. In many occasions, when you will be lending money in the beginning, when you give this tiny loan as the smallest $30, $35 loan, women will be holding this loan and literally shake, couldn't believe that so much money is in her hand. And tears will roll down, cannot believe anybody has trusted her such an enormous amount of money. And she feels that she, nobody believed her, nobody trusted her for a penny. Now this bank comes and gives you so much money. And in her mind, she runs through her experience. And then she resolves that if anybody has trusted her with so much money, she would like to give her life to protect that trust so that that trust is never broken. And exactly she does that. She works very hard to make sure every penny gets paid back on the dot, never delayed. So if you can um, kind of multiply this experience seven and a half million times, you can understand what Grameen Bank is. That's where we are. So one of the things we are trying to encourage them is to send their children to school because we thought this is one way to make a change in the family because education or literacy never entered this family in the history of generations. So at least this will be a new beginning. And they understood the importance of education, so they joined with us and make sure the children are in school. So very quickly we achieved that goal, 100% children of Grameen families being in school. Then we saw that many of these children not only went to school, they're at the top of the classes. That excited us, that for the first time, coming from the poorest families, illiterate families, going into school and being on the top of the class. We got so excited, we thought this needs to be celebrated. Somehow we have to recognize this. So one way we thought we can do that, we introduced scholarships. So anybody who has the top performers in the family, we give the child a scholarship. Right now we give more than 30,000 scholarships throughout Grameen Bank. It's a standard annual feature. We celebrate, we kind of 
give them flowers and the whole village comes together. He got a scholarship and every other child gets excited. Well, what did he do? What did she do? So that way that encourages other students to follow the suit. Then later we found something else. Not only they went to school and some of them coming to the top of the class. Now this time we see some of them are in higher education. They're in medical schools, engineering schools, in universities. That was a very pleasant surprise for us because we didn't expect that this flow to go all the way there. Then we again sat down and discussed what do we do now. So one thing we came up with is introduce education loan. So ever since we are giving education loans because when you enter the higher level it becomes expensive. Most of the families cannot afford to keep the students at that level. So they drop out and quit education and do something else, start vending things or little shops and something. So we said, no way. If you are capable, if you want to go into higher education, entire financing will be done by Grameen Bank. So we do that. Right now we have over 18,000 students in medical schools, engineering schools, universities. And it amazes us to see that. It's a completely different group of people coming there. You meet them, you see there's no difference between these kids or the kids in any university anywhere in the world. But they're coming from the poorest families for the first time, first generation people going into universities and medical schools and so on. Two of them already finished their PhDs. We celebrated that. They finished their PhDs. And many doctors are now practicing, some of them now university teachers in many different departments. So this is a new generation coming from this generation which entered the first time in the Grameen Bank. So our idea is the cycle of poverty which continues within their family should be broken so with these children coming up as a new generation, you have, they will create a new wave rather than join the same old cycle, repetitive cycle that went on for generations and generations. Another aspect that we introduced recently, I think, uh, would be very interesting for you. There are lots of debates. Microcredit, the kind of work that we do, became very well known throughout the world. Many people want to do that. So it created a lot of controversies. One, controver not controversy, I would say criticism that sometimes it's uh, brought out in the discussions on the table. Then microcredit is a wonderful idea, but it works only for entrepreneurial poor, poor who has the capacity to go into business and so on. But most of them are not entrepreneurs. So for them, it don't work. Particularly poorest of the poor don't have the entrepreneurial capacity. Those should, they should be left alone with the safety net programs, meaning handouts, charity program, welfare programs, and that sort of programs. And I always oppose those kind of things by saying that, and this became my conviction, and I continue to maintain that conviction. My conviction is all human beings are entrepreneurs. No exception. So it's, it's built into the human life. It's a, a child is born with that entrepreneurial capacity. It's a human dimension built into it. But we have created a society where many people never discovered the talent that they have inside of them. So. For them, they feel maybe I'm not an entrepreneur. All I can do is work for somebody else. It's not really true that he or she doesn't have it. Simply, that person never had the opportunity to unwrap, uh, unwrap the gift she has inside of her. Society never encouraged it, never allowed it to have a peep into that wonderful gift he or she carries. So I think that's the failure of the society, not the failure of the person. And I give the example of bonsai tree. I said, if you take the best seed of the tallest tree in the forest and plant it in a little flower pot, 
and let it grow. It grows only this big. Then you wonder, what happened to it? We poured our heart out to make it grow, but it doesn't grow. It just becomes this big and looks exactly like the tree that we saw in the forest, but only it's a tiny, tiny one. And I keep saying the poor people are the bonsai people. There's nothing wrong with their seeds. Simply society never gave them the space and never gave them the base on which to grow. If you had the base for them as wide as anybody else, they will grow as tall as anybody else. No fault of the person. So the poverty is not created by the poor people. Sometimes we kind of jump into conclusions it's their fault. They don't work hard or they're stupid, they don't have the training, they don't have the skill. We get a whole list out of it. But that's not true. They work very hard. It's the poor who work, work the hardest, but get the least. That's why they are poor. So it's not the fault of the poor. Then whose fault is it? Who created poverty? And I keep saying that the poverty is created by the system that we built for us. And the system is made up of the institutions that we built. This theoretical framework that we created concepts that we built. So they are at fault. If we had some mechanism to go back to those concepts and theories and the institutions and pick out all the seeds of poverty inside of them, take them out, there will be nobody poor because poverty is not created. The system is now free from poverty, so people are free from poverty. And I give the example of one institution, the institution of bank, banking. Why do they have to say that some people are not credit worthy? Is it their prerogative to make judgment on people? Or people should make judgment on them? Shouldn't we kind of rephrase that question by saying, by redesigning the question by raising it this way? Are the banks people worthy? Isn't that the legitimate question? But the answer is no, they are not. Because if you look around, two-thirds of the world population are not eligible in the eyes of the banks to do business with them. So what kind of institution is it? which doesn't give you the permission to do business. Who are they to judge that whether I can do business or not? If I cannot do business with a bank, then it's the responsibility of the bank to redesign itself so that I can do business with them. It's not my responsibility to redesign myself so that I can do business with them. So that point is missed. As a result, people are refused, rejected from the banking services. So if you don't have that access to financial services, you are thrown into the wolves, the moneylenders, loan sharks, which sucks up everything that you got. And that's what happens every day. We read about it in the newspaper, we read about it in the stories, in the plays, in literature pound of flesh, remember that, Shakespeare, it's all there, but nobody did anything to help them because it, it's not us, it's them, so who cares about them? We are okay, we got the bank account, we got our credit cards, no problem. So this is the problem. So today, something that we built work for the poor people, is it something that we lend money, tiny little money to the poor people? Is that what makes the Grameen Bank? That's all? Or there is something else? If, say, Citibank started giving tiny loans, $30 loans or $50 loans in Bangladesh, will it become a microcredit bank or a Grameen Bank? No, it's not just the size of the loan. It's the, it's the way you do business. That's what makes it microcredit. 
in our business, in our work, there is no collateral. First thing we removed, no collateral. Because if you're asking for collateral to the poor people, they'll never get to you because they have nothing to offer. So that is thrown away, thrown out of the window. No guarantee. You don't need anybody's guarantee. No legal instrument, no papers to be signed which can be taken to the court. We don't go to the court. We said, forget it. For this little money, if you're going to the court, it will be stupid. You'll be spending a lot of money to the lawyers, giving to the lawyers. Why spend those money and create those problems for you? So we abandon that. So it's a collateral tree, no guarantee, no legal instrument. Then how does it work? It's a trust-based banking. It's a mutual trust. And that works. Not only works in Bangladesh, it now works globally, everywhere. So this is the an essence of it. We give loans for income-generating activities so that they can move up, creating their own income opportunity and continue and then help the children to go into school and everything that I said about that and change their life completely. Our goal is to reach, I said, 64% of the borrowers have crossed the poverty line. They are no longer poor. Our goal by 2015, to make sure all the Grameen Bank borrowers get out of poverty completely, 100%. With the Millennium Development Goal, the world is trying to reach a situation where half the poverty will be overcome. Half the number of poor people get out of poverty. That's a global goal. But within Grameen Bank, we have decided we will use the same, no, same years, 2015, to make sure 100% of the borrowers of Grameen families, all the Grameen families get out, out of poverty. And it's an achievable goal. It's not a fantasy. It's not something that you dream, but uh, you feel that maybe you can't achieve it. We can achieve it. And what else? I said the concept is at fault. And I talk, talk about the concept of business, particular one that I choose to demonstrate. I said, look, the way we build the economic theory and build the theory of business and everything that we put into it, based on the assumption that all people who go into business go there to make money. That's the only reason why you go into business, to make money. And make it, theory makes it very clear. It says profit maximization is the mission of business. That's fine. Wonderful. But are all people, everybody is doing that? Is that what they're supposed to do in business? So the theory has, theory has been built on the assumption of one-dimensional human being. Human being has only one urge, it's to make money. That's all. But that's not the real people. That may be the people in the theory. But the real world people is much bigger than that. They have many other arches. They want to touch other people's life. They want to contribute to this world. They want to feel happy in being useful to somebody else. How come we cannot accommodate it within economic theory? How do we have just one dimensional person rather than multi dimensional person? All human beings are multi dimensional beings, not a single dimensional beings. It's a mixture of many things. So I said, at least to justify the real human being into the theory, we should keep at least two kinds of businesses. One kind that we already know, the kind which takes business as a money-making opportunity. The goal is to maximize profit. That's fine. Another business will be a business to do good to people. There no intention of personally benefiting from that. All the benefits should be given to the people that we want to run the business for. And I'm designating it, calling it as a social business and define it by saying it's a non-loss, non-dividend company. It doesn't lose money, but it doesn't give dividend to the investor. That's a social business. We created such company in Bangladesh and encouraging others to create such companies. 
One company uh, drew a lot more attention than others. That's a company that we jointly did in Bangladesh with Danone. Danone is the company which produces the yogurt or the milk products or the water, uh, uh, avian water. So, so we had a joint company with them. We proposed to them, why don't we create a Grameen Danone company in Bangladesh? And our idea of creating this company is to produce yogurt, but for a very special purpose. There are lots of malnourished children in Bangladesh because of poverty, because of a lack of ability of the parents to feed the children well. So the children grow up extremely malnourished. And as, you, as the child grows up malnourished, it becomes how the, he or she becomes a target for all other diseases as she grows up. So idea that we have, why don't we produce yogurt, Danone yogurt, as tasty as it is, and then put all the micronutrients which is missing in those children into the yogurt. All the vitamins, zinc, iron, iodine, whatever is missing, into the yogurt and sell it to the children. Children buy those cheap snacks like ice cream or local sweets or whatever, at the same price, they get the yogurt. And the yogurt company, Grameen Danon Company, recovers all their cost by the sales proceeds, and the children get the health by eating this yogurt. This will be a great thing if they can improve the health. The mission of the business is accomplished. And the owner of the company, the Grameen or the Danone, Gradually, they can take over, take back their investment money, but once they have recouped the investment money, no more dividend coming from there. So don't expect any dividend to come from you because that's not the intention why you build the company. You build the company to help the children get better health. As long as that health is done, your mission is accomplished. So this would be a social business. And another one, we recently signed an agreement with um, Intel Corporation, the information technology chip producer. The chairman of Intel visited us in Bangladesh, and we discussed that, and out of that discussion, this idea of creating an Intel Grameen company as a social business to bring information technology to the poorest people in a way they can change their own life, redesign the whole gadgets and the ways of handling it and bringing information on healthcare and education and everything that is possible uh, to the children and to the families of uh, poor people and ch help them change their own life. And there, Intel doesn't get any dividend out of it. Grameen doesn't get any dividend out of it. But it brings the information technology to the poorest people and runs as a business aren't enough to pay, pay for all the expenses they incur. So these are the examples that we would to, like to carry on in, in terms of social business, in healthcare, in education, in uh, bringing good quality drinking water to the poor people or pe people who don't have that access to pure drinking water. So we need to address these issues as a separate improvement into the overall structure of the economy that we have in our thinking process, the way we do that. And once we accept the uh, idea of social business, many other steps need to be taken. One of such steps will be in the university. You have to teach another course, <laughs> social business. <laughs> and now we have the business school which produces MBAs. And these are the young people, like you are, many of you probably are studying to, be, uh, to get the MBA degree. And MBAs are prepared, the young people are prepared to go out and help the profit-maximizing companies to make more profit. That's where they are getting ready to do that. So we need another department which will be teaching social MBAs to go out and make sure your company reaches out to the people that you want to reach and help them change their life in a social business way.
and design social businesses. How, what is the problem? How do you design that? This is another challenge. Young people will be designing social business, business plans so that this works out both ways. It's a beautiful program, it helps people, it runs as a business. So that will be a wonderful thing. And once we can introduce that, it becomes very powerful because today we can help people only through charities, through the foundation activities. And charities or foundation activities, when you use a dollar, that dollar has only one life. If you use that, it's done. It achieves the goal, but you cannot reuse this dollar. You cannot take it back again. You have done it, it's gone. But in social business, dollar keeps com keep coming back. It continues to recycle. So you reach out to more people. And life become, the life of that dollar becomes endless because it never disappears. So it becomes more, more, and more and more powerful. So this is another area. And the other area that we have to work is in the stock market. Today, the only stock market we have where we can go and find a company where we can become rich overnight. And that's what we're always looking for, which company to choose, where do we put our money, because we want to make money. If I want to do good, I cannot go to the stock market because there is no such company which tells me this company will do good, this and no, money, no profit. So we need a social stock market where all the social businesses will be listed. So that if I want to help the poor women get out of poverty, I see there are 21 companies who are doing that. And I want to choose the best, where they are doing most effectively, most um, um, uh, dedicatedly committed people and getting good results. So I want to put my money there so that I can help more people coming out of poverty, more women coming out of poverty and so on, more children out of the street. That's if this company doing it, I would like to put my money in. So we have a series of parallel kind of institutional arrangements that we have to build. Then we have a world where we can now reach out to all the problems ourselves instead of dumping all the problems on the shoulder of the government. Today, if we see a problem, it's that government should do it. We citizens are as powerful, sometimes more powerful than the government because we are more innovative than the government. We are quick in action. Government takes a lot of time before they can make a decision. And then it gets as stuck with the bureaucracy and so on. But we are free as individual citizens. We can build out things and address maybe a little corner of the world, maybe a little corner of our country. But we have demonstrated it. Once we have demonstrated it, then it can be replicated by anybody. It becomes very powerful. Like we replicate microcredit, for example. Now that microcredit idea has spread all over the world. And some countries, people invite us to help them set up microcredit program because they have lots of questions, lot of worries, whether it will work in their country or not. And we tell them, why don't you give us a challenge? We come and set it up for you. And we are calling that build, operate, transfer, or build, operate, and own kind of uh, contract. You give us the contract, we come and do it for you. And many countries have invited us and we are doing that. We have done it in Myanmar, we have done it in Kosovo, we are doing it in Tur Turkey, in Zambia, in Tanzania, in Costa Rica, in uh, Guatemala, in India, so in China. So there's a lot of countries where we are invited to do this. And now recently we, are in we, we invited ourselves Nobody invited us as such to do it in Queens, in New York. <laughs> so same way we build, operate, and build up a government program within the USA, right, right here in New York City, in Queens. We're starting out with the Queens. So I was telling them the Queens that the Queens is the Jobra of uh, USA. Jobra was the first village where we worked when I was in the university. So now Queens becomes our Jobra, it's where we start building it up. Because this has an interesting challenge here. Because this is a country with such a sophisticated banking, but at the same time you see pawn shops everywhere. This doesn't sound right. If you have a decent banking system, why there should be pawn shops? And check cashing companies, would you believe that? You have your own check, you earn the money, you can't get the equivalent of the money that is in the check. You have to give 20% to the guy who 
gives you in cash. What happened to the banking system? No, banking system is not available to them because they cannot open an account. Would you believe people cannot, cannot open an account in their bank, in the bank? They are rejected because too small amount, we are not interested in that amount. So they are forced to go to this people who charge enormous amount of money just every month, not just once. Every month you get your check, you get to the check cashing counters and get 20% less of what you earned. You earned hard, your hard way, but somebody takes away your money. That's what the challenge, that's what the, in, we want to address to what we call Grameen America to bring this, all this together. And uh, we are launching it there to see how to address those issues. It's, 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 it's unbelievable that uh, it can happen. Uh, and also at the same time, we see the payday loans. You need a little money in the middle of the month. You don't have the money to fix your tire or something, you fix your car, so you go to the payday loans. You pay as much as 40%, 50% interest on those loans. Nobody cares. So these are the issues for social business. These are the issues for addressing. Uh, that's why we're trying to just develop a prototype. We'd be very happy if you can associate yourself into that kind of program to see how to bring ideas, to bring it into a kind of banking framework rather than uh, predatory activity of money lenders and so on and so forth. And the other point, and I'll stop, as I said, I was giving student loans to Grameen Bank and they are moving into higher education. More and more children are, more and more students are coming into higher education. When I go around, like I'm do, today I'm doing that and uh, coming to university campus, I always invite the universities to keep two scholarships for Grameen children to come and study there. Coming from the literate families, from the poorest families, these two, two scholarships, one for a girl, one for a boy, to come and study in you know, a top of the world, world class uh, universities, that changes the whole scenario. These are, these are the young people who are looking for opportunities and for on their own, they will never make it. But if the first lift is given, it creates a wave and it encourages everybody else to work hard so that they can achieve those scholarships. And we started getting responses, like uh, we got the response from Yuha in Women's University in Korea. They immediately said, we want to do that. We'll bring two girls from, this is Women's University, so they want to take two girls from Grameen Bank every year and give them scholarships to study there, pay all the expenses. And we are very delighted. So this is one opportunity for two girls to go to Korea. And then uh, I was talking to Oxford University, I was uh, talking to the uh, one of the smaller groups, and I repeated it, and the Oxford University said, okay, that's a deal. You come and lecture here once, and we'll give you two scholarships. <laughs> <laughs> so then I said, okay, I accept the deal. <laughs> so they will give us two scholarships. So I will invite Boston University and MIT and everybody else here to offer that university, uh, that scholarship. It does two things. It transforms what uh, the perception of the poor people themselves, and also it brings a new insight into the classroom. This, you talk about poverty as a kind of abstract thing. It's not abstract, it's your, your friend, your uh, roommate. He comes from, or she comes from, the poorest families and trying to get out. And what does it mean, what poverty is? You don't have to listen to the big wise people writing books. She is a book by herself. And it's an open book, you talk how to get things out. So that way it's an interaction both ways. And some of you, through this kind of relationship, some of the students from BU and MIT and other uh, universities and colleges here in Boston come to Bangladesh or other countries in Mexico or Guatemala or Costa Rica and find out what's happening. So inter-exchange would be a very important thing. And recently I was in Riyadh in uh, King Saud University and when I proposed, they immediately decided that they will give 50 scholarships to Grameen children to study in Riyadh University. So that's another opportunity for us to do that. So this is the way you open up for the, for, for the people so that they can show that the talent is not one-sided. 
is universal. Everybody has the same talent. Everybody has the same creativity, energy. It's a question of opening up, giving the opportunities. It's not a question of giving charities, giveaways. Giveaways has a very limited kind of application. The giving opportunities, equal opportunities, not uh, uh, something that you have to force yourself to, to do that so that they can change their own life. And once we do that, then nobody has to be a poor person anymore. Poverty is not part of human being. It's artificially imposed on human being. We can peel it off. And if we can peel it off, there'll be no poor person. And I keep saying, all we have to aim is to create poverty museums. Set a date. On that date, we are going to have a poverty museum because we will not have any more poor people left in our country or left in our city or left in our district, whatever. Then we'll have our poverty museums so that next generation children read about poverty but don't know, wouldn't know what poverty is. So we will take them, the whole class, to the museum to show what poverty used to be like. And that's the decision we have to make. That's the kind of pledge we have to create. By this date, we would create our poverty museum. In Bangladesh, we kind of repeat saying that by 2030, we'll have our poverty museum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Eunice will take some questions. <laughs> Professor Eunice will take questions. Yeah. We have a couple of mics in the center here. Please make your way to the microphones. I ask that you use the microphones. And please be brief in your comment or your question. Yes, sir. I was wondering if any of the entrepreneurs that you set up in business ever come to be in competition with each other and how that might be resolved. And a different kind of question, do you also fund cooperatives. I'm familiar with the Mondragon Cooperative in Spain. I've been there. Uh, I think it's a complement to the kind of thing you're doing. Maybe you're doing some similar kinds of things besides individuals or small businesses, cooperatives also. Yeah. Uh, on the cooperative side, let me quickly add, uh, if you look at Grameen Bank itself, it almost looks like a cooperative. So all the borrowers of Grameen Bank own the bank. So although we are not approaching it through the cooperative law, but the spirit and the structure of bank is a cooperative. So cooperative is one good way to address this issue. And the competition among the social businesses. You see, this word competition is coming from the profit maximizing side. Because you want to make money, I want to make money. So I want to make more money by putting you down and me getting up. If you are a social business trying to help poor children out of poverty, and I'm in the social business trying to help poor children out of the poverty, would we, should I try to pull you down and me taking over the market? Or we say, wonderful, we believe in the same thing. We shake hands, work together, spend days and nights talking about together, how to do it better together. Isn't that what uh, automatically? So the concept of competition will not come in the way you see it in the other way. Because there you personally involved. You want to make money for yourself. So you compete, take business from each other. But here it's a more collaborative and improvement. How do we do it better? Because our commitment is to achieve the goal and how fast we can do it. That's what the important thing would be. So my idea is probably this mo there'll be more of a, uh, collaboration than of competition. Yes, there'll be some competition, competition of pride. We did it faster than you did, like uh, uh, the, in the sports, uh, like our team is better than your team uh, kind of spirit, that we did it faster than our city made it faster than your city. And we say, hey, we are ahead of you, that sort of thing. So the whole thing will be very different. But there'll be competition in many areas with the profit maximizing companies. For, for example, I'm a profit-maximizing pharmaceutical company. You are a social business pharmaceutical company. You want to make the cost of the pr 
uh, medicine, uh, the price of the medicine as low as possible so that many more people can buy it and cure themselves. I'm the one trying to promote it and make it fancy so that I can charge more for the same amount of money I spend and add up a lot of other things. So I will uh, see that uh, uh, you are taking away my market and so on. Probably that competition will come, uh, but we have to work it out how we can reach out to the people which uh, profit maximizing company is not reaching out. Thank you. Thank you for coming, doctor. Uh, just had a question about the growth of your capital base for the bank. And uh, as you had mentioned, it's more about uh, making loans that generate income. But as part of poverty, I'm sure you understand that there's a lot of people who obviously have to take care of their uh, consumption needs. So I was wondering if any part of the loans, if it's understood with the uh, deal between the, the lender and the borrower, if uh, consumption is part of that. Yeah. One way to try to explain to people uh, from our borrower side when they want to see, we always give one example in Bangladesh. They understand it very quickly. We say, this money that we give you, you it's, uh, the mango is a very popular fruit in Bangladesh. We say, this money we give you, you consider this is the mango tree. You don't eat the tree you eat the mango. So let it grow and have plenty of mangoes and eat them. So you have to have this period when you have this waiting period so that you can start enjoying. We are not against consumption, but you have to produce the money to create, have the consumption, you improve the consumption. Don't eat up the tree because then you don't get the mango. That's, that, they understand very well. They, they, in their concepts, it's very clear what they, want, what they need to do. But there are emergencies. You need money for emergencies. You don't want to go and use up the capital. So we encourage them to save. Every Grameen borrower has a savings account, and lots of different kinds of savings account, including pension funds. So there are many arrangements for emergency coping without touching the capital money. So this is what we have built into the system. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I have a philosophical question, and that is, you said that you want, um, and you've said on many occasions in the past, that you'd like for someday there to be poverty museums. But in how do you define poverty? A very poor American is a very rich Bangladeshi. And um, so there's always going to be people with more and less. And so what, what does the end of poverty mean? Yeah. Uh, there will always be some have more, some have less, less. But poverty is something that in our work, the way we define, uh, see, uh, our staff has to work for a certain goals. And these are defined in terms of uh, uh, achieving stars. Like if you have 100% repayment in your branch, you get a star because for 100% repayment. If you make profit in your branch, you get another star. So if you help all the families in your branch get over the poverty, then you get another star, meaning that your branch, now all the 5,000 borrowers, they are above poverty. How do we judge above poverty? So we have 10 indicators. Number one, do they have solid roof over their head or a leaky roof? If it is a solid roof, you have achieved one point, that you have a solid roof. Do they have sanitary latrine in the house? Yes, then you point, score another point. Do they sleep on the floor or do they sleep on the cot or a bed? If you sleep on the bed, all the family members sleep on the bed, you have another score. So it goes down the list. There are 10 such indicators. If you succeed scoring nine of them and missing one, you're still poor. So we'll help you score the last one that you're missing so that you have all 10. When all the 10s are scored, then you are out of poverty. So this is one way, poverty. Poverty is something with your quality of life. Do you have all three meals a day, every day of the year, no problem? Do you have any uh, reserves for your uh, uh, emergencies, coping with the floods and other things? How much money you have saved in the bank? Is it minimum of this? Then all this together, we define this is what, if you can achieve all this, you are cleared. 
That's how 64% of our borrowers have fulfilled all those 10 conditions. We say they are not any more poor people. That's how we do it. Whether that person and Bill Gates has a big difference, we don't care. But this person is not a poor person anymore. It's not as rich as Bill Gates, but it's not a poor person. That's all. My name is Alice Amaranak, and I'm from Smith College. Um, most of the clients have, who have proven successful with microfinance have been women, and a lot of, and because of their willingness to form group structures and to inve reinvest in food and education. And my question is whether you think their success has to do with gender or their group structure. And if it's group structure, could very risky demographics such as young girl boys, for example, in Honduras, come together as a group, reinvest in the food and education, and prove successful, and it, could this model be used in the future to help alleviate poverty and serve a very underserved demographic? Yeah. Uh, gender thing came from another angle for us. Uh, I was complaining during my first initial confrontation with banks. The banks are unjust because they reject poor people. And then I started adding one more thing. I said, banks are unjust because they reject the women. Because not even 1% of the borrowers of the conventional banks in Bangladesh, even today, happens to be women. So I said, this system is a rotten system because women can't get in. So when I began in 1976, I wanted to make sure half the borrowers in my program are women because I've been complaining against the other banks. So I don't want to repeat it in my bank. Then I go to the women to invite them to take loans. And women said, no, no, I can't take the loan. I don't know anything about money. Give the money to my husband. He's the one who understands money. I don't know. Because she never did it before. So it took us enormous amount of effort to break the fear. And it took us six years of continuous encouraging them and trying to peel off the fear. And finally, we made it 50-50. Then we noticed that money going to the family through women brought so much more benefit to the family than the same amount of money going to the family through men. So again, we came to another question. Should we continue with 50-50 or change it? We decided to change it. We wanted to focus on women. That's how we became overwhelmingly women, 97% women. So that's, we see the benefit coming to the family. Impact in the family is much more focused when it we do it to the women. That's how we do it. Five-member groups and other things, this is uh, part of the social achievements. We, there is something called 16 decisions in Grameen Bank. They understand it much better when you do it in a five-group sense of accomplishment that you have done that. that this could be applied with uh, boys and girls equally. Et but here we needed to do this because women had to feel that they're, they can achieve, accomplish all the things they never did before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, thank you for being here. And hi, everybody. Um, my question is, is about a criticism that I've read recently, particularly with Al Gore now winning the Nobel Peace Prize for his environmental work, Juan Gary Matai winning for environmental work, and, and you, sir, as well, winning for your, your work with poverty. Um, the criticism has been that the Nobel Peace Prize is no longer about peace, and that it's about just awarding people who do good things, which I, I don't have a problem with. But but do you, what do you think about that? Because I really think, I disagree. I, th I think that it actually is about peace, and I think your work contributes to that. So could, could you speak to that, about how your work has aided peace and conflict resolution across the world? Well, first you have to ask the committee who did that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know them, but... I was not part of it. <laughs> but uh, explain it, the issue that we have been always raising many, many years, that if you look at the word peace, most often we rush into interpreting it as an absence of conflict. Absence of conflict is not equal to peace. It could be a very tense situation, but no conflict. I have all the nuclear warheads in my backyard, so there's peace in the world. <laughs> So that's not a peace. That's simply you have terrorized the world. Yep, good point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, 
There are more than 15,000 nuclear warheads ready to go. Probably a couple of them could ruin the, destroy the whole world, but who cares? We have 15,000 warheads sitting around, and bulk of them here, right here in this country. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> more than half is in this, in this country. Uh, so that's, that's uh, something that we want to forget about. We don't want to have those weapons of mass destruction anywhere. That's not peace. Uh, so argument, uh, we were saying that poverty is a kind of breeding ground for violence. If you don't have food, you don't have place to sleep, anybody come to you can give you food and give you a gun. And they will be fight for anything you want them to do. And that's not a very safe thing. It's very difficult when people are poor to go through the same kind of logic that anybody else would go through. So one of the way to enhance the possibility of peace is to remove poverty. So that's one link. Poverty is a threat to peace. The removal of poverty enhances the peace. That's one. The climate thing is uh, something that we feel very strongly. We are very happy that IPCC got the Nobel Prize and Al Gore got the Nobel Prize because this is an issue which everybody should get concerned about. And for us, this, for here, it may be an academic issue, how it's going, what kind of thing can happen. But in Bangladesh, it's a life and death issue. Bangladesh is a tiny country about the size of Florida, state of Florida with 150 million people, which is about half the population of the United States. So with that kind of population in uh, one tiny place, and then a flat country, 20% of Bangladesh is under one meter above the sea level. So very close to the sea level. We, land and water is side by side in Bangladesh all along. So sea level is rising right now, as we talk, as a two meters to eight meters per year, uh, sorry, millimeters per year. So imagine if you keep on doing that, how much of this land would be habitable in Bangladesh? First, our agriculture, our ecology will be destroyed. Saline water gets into our country. There are 100, the con Bangladesh is a small country territory-wise, there are 230 major rivers crisscrossing the country. So that's where we live. So sea level rising destroys the whole thing. So for us, it's uh, something that uh, threatens us every day. So to see how to reduce that, the global warming, would be something we would like to see the whole world get together to resolve that, because we can't resolve it. We can resolve our poverty issue. That we can handle. But we cannot resolve global warming. That's why by focusing that, by giving the peace prize to, uh, to uh, IPCC and Al Gore, uh, this, has been high, this issue has been highlighted so that we can make decisions. Where does it come from? What are the sources of this? Uh, uh, emission, greenhouse gas emission, and Kyoto Protocol, and well, what happens after the Kyoto Protocol? Are we ready for that? Can we make binding uh, treaty signed for all nations to agree that they will all reduce greenhouse gas emission so that the, we can reduce it by 90% by 2050? Those are the issues. Dr. Yunus, you're an inspiration, and uh, I would like to ask you for more inspirational words because I wonder how you were able to not get disheartened, to not lose hope and sight of your goal in the poverty situation of Bangladesh. I was in Tanzania this summer, and I held children crying because they hadn't eaten in days. And I was there, and I brought, I brought $800, and they were all taken up by two people who bought motorcycles. How do you not get disheartened? How did you manage to create something like what you created in situations so corrupt because of the poverty? Yeah. 
Well, I was, that's the story I was telling. I was disheartened, I was frustrated uh, back in 1974, 75, and that's, I was trying to do something personally. Uh, I didn't, I, I felt that I cannot solve the problem of the country, but I can definitely help solve the problem of one person. That's what I did. And that led me to do the second person and third person, and then it expanded. So that, I think that's a good way, instead of trying to solve the problem of the whole world, we can take a little bite-sized piece of the problem and overcome that. Once we can overcome that, it gives us the confidence that, yes, it can be done. I can do another one. So two, three, four, if you do that, then you, are, you created a system. And somebody said, are you doing that? Can I do three myself? Okay, you do it. This is how I did it. Like microcredit, we did it in one village and we repeated it to other villages and expanded. And then other countries said, we can do it too. So now it has a, become a global kind of phenomenon that people say, yes, we can do it in our country too. So this is how it began. So that's, when it works like that, then you no longer feel frustrated because you have done something, it's working, somebody is picking it up. And I don't lose heart because I see you're listening to me, you don't walk away. <laughs> so that gives me courage that yes, they're listening, and somebody say, hey, I'm going to do this. In a, in a uh, gathering like this, there are hundreds of students, hundreds of people sitting here listening, and not everybody will rush to do it. But I know for sure there'll be one person sitting here today who will go out and do something. And that's all I'm waiting for. And that's the one person which will make a big impact. And others will try probably because of the circumstances, have to pay attention to something else, move out. But there'll be one person who will persist, who will be persistent and make it happen. And that's what changes the whole world. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, sir. Um, I think you really thoroughly soaked all our hearts for inspiration, so I really thank you for that. Um, one question which I had, had was that um, how do you, being this Grameen system, um, profit is, you're not, you've admitted that you, know, you separated social firms from profit maximizing firms, but how do you manage to get people to you know, collaborate with you in this effort? Because in something which you've clearly stated that is not a prof profit maximizing firm, there's mainly a primary social, social uh, so, excuse me, a social firm. How do you manage to get people's trust and get them as inspired as you in such a cause, where there's such a, you know, such a opportunity for you know almost the whole system just not working out? Right. Um, I mean, it's not easy. So how did you manage to uh, put this effort together? I suppose. Uh, let me quickly add that I define social business in two ways. One, I just mentioned non-loss, non-dividend company with a social objective. The other one is any company which is owned by the poor. A profit maximizing company owned by the poor is also a social business because now this directly helps the poor people by owning the company. And Grameen Bank is a social business of the second kind. It's a profit making company but entirely owned by the poor people. So we give the dividends to the poor people so they benefit from that. Last year, uh, we gave 100% dividend to our shareholders. All of them are shareholders, so they got 100% dividend, meaning that in one year they got back their money back. So imagine every year they get 100%. These are all additional income they're getting through that. So that way, uh, no conflict there, that the poor people can own a profit-maximizing company. They can, they individually, they may be small. Individually, loan may be $30, $50, average of $150, but collectively, it's a billion dollar business a year. So that's a huge big, because the number is so big. If, if each person of seven and a half million people, suppose, saves one dollar a month, one dollar, the whole month, then you have saved seven and a half million dollars. And if you keep doing every month, imagine in 31 years, how many millions of dollars you can save, just one dollar. And then you can buy up any company in the country because you have enough money in your total kitty. Then you go and buy up, it's your company, and you make profit out of that, and it's your money. So that way, uh, the logic of uh, being poor but many can be used to control the economy in their favor. 
So that's how I do, don't see conflict. Other one, I, uh, I, uh, I'm not a poor person. You are not a poor person. We create a company which we promise not to take any money as a profit for us. We are doing it to help achieve the social goal, goal that we have designed for this company. That's it. If we like it, we do it. If you don't like it, you don't have to do it. It's an option. Social business is an option. Nobody is forcing you to do that. If we think that, yes, we would like to do that, we would like to start a cash checking, uh, sorry, check cashing company uh, ourselves. And we'll take care of that. That's we are in business. But not for business to, like the existing companies who want to do it, make more and more money out of it. No, we want to give them legitimate service, minimum possible fee for covering our cost, and they get a good service. That's it. That's a social business. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. It's a real honor to be here and listen to you. Um, my name is Jeff Blander, and I've lived the last two years in Tanzania working in healthcare and medical technologies. And uh, this past summer, we had five MBAs join me, and we worked with the Private Hospital Association, and we surveyed over 300 physicians and nurses. And at the top of their list was access to low-cost loans with reasonable uh, return Date. So, for example, the average loan that they've been getting is anywhere between 50 and 60 percent, and they have to repay it over two years. And so the question I have is just general thoughts that you may have regarding access to capital to health care providers to stimulate innovation for diagnostics and other uh, sorts of treatments. Yeah. Health is another very important issue for poverty because most of the people that uh, have difficulty getting over poverty are related to health-related problems. So they cannot overcome the problems uh, of health to move out of poverty. So uh, unless we can provide good quality health care system, uh, it will be very difficult to get people out of poverty. So that's one frontier that we have to work very hard. Uh, one of the ways, uh, yes, and financing is a very important thing. There are many, many ways uh, of doing that. We, in our way, we provide uh, health insurance so that uh, this is coverage of health insurance within the system, create a health insurance program, create uh, health uh, care services to match that. This is one. And also uh, create social business. So if, we can create, if social business is accepted, many people are interested, next, next thing to do is to create a social business fund. So if you want to start a healthcare thing and you show that you can run it as a business, you can recover your cost and still reach out to the poorest people that you want, social business fund or a venture capital will come to you because this is dedicated to the social business. And you, are, you have offered a brilliant business plan for that, and that's a business. So all these venture, social venture capital, social uh, uh, loan funds, and all those things are possible to create that uh, situation. And in Tanzania, same as in Bangladesh. It's a, these are the areas that we have to work together. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Hopefully we can come to you soon. I Thanks. hope so. We'll look forward to it. I've received a note that I can only take two more questions. Okay. So I'm sorry for the rest of the folks on the line. Uh, sir with the green shirt, you are the last question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hello, Dr. Yunus. Um, I'm from the School of Public Health, and uh, like you, I'm a fellow subcontinental. And I've trained in Western medicine and, you know, uh, to a large part in Western thought. Uh, but I've always been sort of deeply suspicious of, um, you know, the import of Western med uh, uh, methods and models uh, into um, sort of indigenous societies. And uh, the way I look at it, and you know, uh, medical anthropology informs one of the fact that uh, traditional societies and uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, indigenous societies pretty much got on very well on their own. Uh, until, um, you know, I don't wish to mean uh, to, to, to be offensive, but until uh, Western uh, civilizations kind of impacted on them and through their entire systems of gear. Uh, and so, you know, uh, you know I, I'm responding to you, uh, some of your comments, uh, which I heard earlier about the fact that, uh, you know, we need to alleviate our poverty and we need to sort of become more Western. I mean, perhaps you didn't say, say that, but that's what I picked up and that's what I'm picking up all around me. And, uh, you know, we need to be more Western. We need to, we need to sort of do what the West does. And I'm, I'm kind of deep, uh, 
my, my suspicion about these areas and my, um, you know, deep skepticism about these areas is increasing. And I, I'm often kind of wondering how much uh, uh, we ourselves, uh, you know, are importing and internalizing these needs, uh, these, this need to rescue ourselves and rescue the rest of us uh, into more Western models. Uh, what do you feel about that? Well, basically, I would say I'm more uh, <clears throat> in the way uh, I don't look at the Eastern, Western right away. I see what works, uh, and I go for it. Uh, and if I see it's not working, I look for something else. Uh, I'm not sold to Eastern. I'm not sold to the Western. I'm not North or the South. doesn't matter to me. As long as it works, I'm for it. So that's how I do that, and a uh, lot of things that we have done uh, – got mixed up with many different kinds of things. It's not quite east, west, west or something. It's a mixture of a lot of things. Yeah. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, if we allow societies to formulate their own methods and reach their own levels of equilibrium without kind of impacting on them, you know, they are completely capable of finding their own methods. Sure. So shouldn't we be really focusing on not interfering with them and not so, sort, of, sort of selling them arms and not sort of, uh, you know, uh, perhaps uh, cheating them out of trade agreements, et, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, they're yeah. completely capable of uh, sort of settling down on their own. Yeah. So that's, that's mm -hmm. an idea that yeah. I've often had. Uh, this reminds me of my earlier days when I was doing this. The controversy that I had within Bangladesh uh, comes similar to it, not quite about it. So don't take it as if I'm answering your question because it takes a little bit more time to understand each other. Uh, the, uh, people were accusing me in Bangladesh, uh, uh, you are destroying our culture by getting women into this business and uh, getting the money. They're not supposed to do this. They're supposed to take care of the family. Uh, they're good at that. This is our, our culture requires the woman should be it in, house, in homes and take care of the families and so on. I said, I don't understand what you mean by our culture. To me, culture is something which is a dynamic thing. It's not a static thing. If we always maintained our culture, we would be at... <laughs> See, if you are always maintaining our culture, we would be in the caves. We will not get out of it. What's wrong with no, being no. in the caves? No, no, that, nothing wrong. The fact that we came out of it, not that somebody forced us, we saw that it's more comfortable living outside. So we came out. <laughs> so that's how we adjusted ourselves. I said all cultures are made to be destroyed, to be created anew. A culture which remains stagnant, that's a dead culture. And we don't want to have a dead culture. We want to grow. Culture... Culture today in 2007 will not be the same thing the culture of 2027. It will be different culture right here in this town. You don't notice it, but things will change. Your children, their children will behave very differently than our children, and we as children, what we behaved. So in the last 20 years, the kind of changes that took place everywhere, not only in Bangladesh or India, or yeah, it's also the United States. Things have changed dramatically. We don't notice it because we are, we are living through it. If somebody, you are an anthropologist, you will step back and see dramatic changes. Women in Bangladesh 20 years back were a different kind of woman than today. Universally, not just in the city or something. They are totally different women. Today, they have cell phones in their hands. Because cell phone is such a widely used vehicle for everybody is cheap, everybody gets it. So women never thought that they will have their cell phone. So with the cell phone in the villages, these are not the same village 20 years back or even 10 years back. So things will happen that way. It's a cont and the change, the rate of change is becoming so fast that if somebody slept for 20 years and woke up, they won't recognize what happened. They will be shocked. This is the world that we see. So this is what the culture is all about. Culture is to fit me. I'm not supposed to fit the culture. So f culture has to grow with me. If it, if it doesn't grow with me, it's no culture. It's a dead wood in my neck. I don't, culture shouldn't, shouldn't be dead wood in anybody's neck. That's the point I always make. Thank you.
Um, Dr. Yunus, you've mentioned a difference between um, social entrepreneurship ventures like the Grameen Bank and a difference between uh, profit maximization um, firms. But how do you feel about uh, the, some of these uh, private companies like uh, Acción International and Compartamos that have seen that with 98% return, 98% of these loans being paid back, now that they've gotten into it and these private equity funds have been involved in microcredit? Well, I, again, uh, I distinguish two sides. One, the profit maximizing company and a social business. And also here you raise a separate question. What is microcredit? That's the basic question you're raising. Uh, we com microcredit became a very popular word very quickly. So everybody claimed that ours is a microcredit because immediately people say, ah, this is a good thing you're doing because you said you're microcredit. Every agricultural bank in the world said we are doing microcredit. Every uh, loan and savings association say we are doing microcredit. Because it's a familiar word, people have respect for the word, so everybody wants to introduce themselves as microcredit. But if you kind of scratch the surface, you find out they are not microcredit. They are doing something else. So what is microcredit? That has to be very clear. And to me, interest rate is also one indicator, whether you are in microcredit or not. The issue that you raise is about interest rate. Uh, and I define the interest rate for microcredit. I said, if you are a genuine microcredit, or you would be operating on the green area of interest rate. And the green area of interest rate is cost of fund at the market price plus 10% maximum. And if you are within that bend, then you are a good microcredit program and your interest rate is in the green area, acceptable area. If it is cost of fund plus 10 to 15%, then you are in the yellow area of microcredit, meaning that you are on the high side, but it's still microcredit, but try to push it down, get to the green area. But if you are cost of fund plus 15% and above, then you are red area, which is the loan shark area. You are no longer microcredit. So you now figure it out what, what, what will be my answer in the case, exact case that you have mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank thank you. you Dr. Eunice.